In our last video for chapter six, we're going to take a look at automorphisms. An isomorphism from a group to itself is called an automorphism. So essentially we're just saying we have an isomorphism, but it's from G to G under some mapping phi. Again, phi is the isomorphism or automorphism. If we collect all of those together, so all of the possible automorphisms of a group G, that is called the automorphism group of G denoted ought G. So let's look back at D4. We're going to show that D4 is isomorphic to itself, which is what makes it an automorphism. And we're actually going to collect all of the automorphisms of D4, which is all of the um, rotations and reflections that we've already looked at. So again, I'm going to kind of rush through a little bit the actual permutations just because we've spent a lot of time on this in chapter one. Um, and I think we even revisited it uh, here in chapter six. So again, E is one goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, four goes to four, which means nothing happened, right? Everything stayed the same. However, E is an automorphism from D4 or of D4. So it's an isomorphism from D4 to D4, which means it's an automorphism. R is another automorphism. So each line of my table is going to be an automorphism. R takes one to two, two to three, three to four, four goes back to one. Again, we're rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise. R squared would take one to three, so we're just moving two places and two to four. R cubed would take one to four, four would go to three, three would go to two, etc. Then we're going to look at the flips and I'm choosing this line for a flip simply because I cho chose that line previously, so I'm going to keep everything the same. So in this case, one and three would map to themselves and two would map to four. If I looked at RF, that means I'm rotating first, so one, two, three, four, and then flipping across that diagonal, which gives me one here and three here. And remember, when I'm writing my permutation, then I take out the middleman. So I'm looking from here, one went to four and four went to one. So if I look here, one went to the position of four and four went to the position of one. And then two and three also swapped places. Now, if I look at R squared F, again, I'm going to first rotate to get one, two, three, four, and then flip which gives me three and one and four and two. And then I take out the middleman and I say one went down to where three was and three went back up to where one was. So you can see that one and three just swapped places, but two and four stayed exactly where they were. And then lastly, we have R cubed F, which is one, two, three, oops, that's not right one, two, three, four, and then flip, which gives me three here and one here and two here and four here. So now taking out the middleman, I have one went down to where two was and two went to where one was. So one and two swapped places and three and four swapped places. So again, to reiterate, the each line of my table is considered an automorphism because the group containing one, two, three, and four um, was still, it's still all of the same elements. We're just mapping them to a different position. So these are all automorphisms from a group to itself. And then if we collect all of them, it's called the automorphism group of G. Another type of automorphism is called an inner automorphism, and that is induced by a specific element of G. 
So you can do this for each and every element of G. In this example, we're going to use R. And the inner automorphism induced by R, in this case, denoted phi sub R, is essentially taking every element that's in our group and multiplying it. Again, this is function composition because that's what we do with D4. We're going to take that element R on the left, whichever element we're, in, we're using, so R, E, and then the inverse. Now, if you'll notice, I didn't include a Cayley table here. I included instead our Cayley diagram because it's going to help us make short work of this. So what I'm going to do is for each of these elements, I'm just going to use R and then R inverse, and we're going to see what, if anything, happens. So let's take a look at the rotation first. So here's what we're saying. We start with R, so we're starting always at E. I'm going to do R and then E, which means do nothing, and then do R inverse, which takes me back to E. So in this inner automorphism induced by R, E will map to E. For R, I'm taking, again, always starting at E, I'm taking R and then R and then R inverse. So R, R, R inverse. Notice that got me back to R. So R maps to R. We started with R, we ended with R. Let's take a look at the next one. R and then R squared and then R inverse takes me back to R squared and then R and then R cubed and R inverse takes me back to R cubed. So we can see for this particular inner automorphism that nothing has changed. E maps to itself, R maps to itself, R squared maps to itself, R cubed maps to itself. Now let's take a look at F. Again, I'm going to take R and then F and then R inverse, R, R, F, R inverse, R, R squared F, R inverse, and R, R cubed F, R inverse. And let's see if any of these change. So again, if I start with R and then I do F and then R inverse, whoops, <laughs> let's do that again. R and then F and then R inverse says do R but in the opposite direction that you should. That gives me R squared F. So now we have a change. F has mapped to R squared F. Now let's take a look at RF. So we take R and then RF and then R inverse would give me R cubed F. R and then R squared F and then R inverse takes me to F. And lastly, R, R cubed F, and then R inverse takes me to RF. So notice I still have the same elements that I started with, which is what makes it an automorphism. And this particular automorph inner automorphism maps all of the rotations to themselves F goes to R squared F, R F to R cubed F, R squared F to F, and R cubed F to R F. Now, if I wanted to, again, collect all of the inner automorphisms, which means I would need to find phi sub E, phi sub R, phi sub R squared, phi sub R cubed, phi sub F, phi sub r f, phi sub r squared f, and phi sub r cubed f. I would have to collect all of those and note that some of these are actually going to end up being the same. So if I wanted to look, for instance, say at phi um, r cubed, let's see what happens. Uh, let's just test a few. We'll test a couple of rotations and a couple of reflections. And we'll just see, do they give us the same thing that phi sub r gave us? So let's try. This would give us r cubed, one, two, three, and then r, 
and then one, two, three. It takes us back to R. So R took me back to R. I'm going to use a different color here just to make sure. So R did, in fact, take me back to R, replacing here R cubed R, R inverse cubed. R cubed, again, I would be looking at R cubed, and then R cubed, and then R inverse. So 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, back to R cubed. So yes, this one does hold true. But let's now take a look at a couple of the reflections and see. So again, RF, I'm going to do R cubed, and then RF, and then the inverse of R cubed. So 1, 2, 3, R cubed, and then RF, and then the inverse of R cubed, 1, 2, 3, gives me R cubed F. And that's what we had before. And again, R cubed F, so R cubed, oops, let me try again, R cubed, R cubed F, R cubed, again, R cubed, and then 1, 2, 3, F, and then inverse, which would be 1, 2, 3, gives me RF. So I've only checked four, but just trust me on this one. I'm going to change this color to phi R cubed. So this is the inner automorphism induced by R cubed. In fact, is exactly the same as the inner automorphism induced by R. And in fact, what we end up with is we only have four in our automorphisms. So we have phi of R, we have phi of the identity, and phi of R we already said was the same as phi of um, R cubed. And then we have phi of H, which is one of the flips, and phi of D prime, which is one of the diagonals. And again, I'm using F, R, F, R squared F, and R cubed F, so you can figure out which one those are. But you actually end up with four distinct, as opposed to the eight that we might consider um, that we should have had. Let's take a look at one theorem that you're going to see quite often. And this theorem says for every positive integer n, the automorphism group of Z sub n is isomorphic to U of n. Now, let's just, before we get into this, let's just recall that Z sub n is all of the values from 0 to n under modular mod n addition. That's what we're talking about when we're looking at Z sub n u of n we've been working with quite a lot and these are the values that are um, less than n and relatively prime to n now to be clear i'm not saying that these two groups are isomorphic it's not possible because of course they're not going to have the same number of elements z of n has n elements and u of n obviously has less than that in general less than or equal to that because we're dealing with values that are relatively prime to n what i am saying is the automorphism group of z8 is isomorphic to u of 8 or zn is isomorphic to u of n so let's take a look at an example using u8 and z8 so u of 8 is 1 3 5 and 7 those are the values that are relatively prime to 8 and less than 8. Just want to point out, in addition to that, that z sub 8 is generated by values relatively prime to n. So z sub 8 is actually generated by 1, 3, 5, and 7, and that is also obviously the group u of 8.
Now, why do I make a point of that? Well, we know that generators have to map to generators. So when I'm looking at the automorphism group, essentially what I'm going to do is take each of these values and I'm going to map them to the generators of Z8 or Zn. So I'm going to say, let alpha sub one of one map to one. And then that would give alpha sub, oops, changed the wrong value. Alpha sub one of two would map to two. And alpha sub one of three would map to three and so forth. Then I'm also going to define alpha sub three of one to map to three. So again, I'm mapping it to another generator. So this is one automorphism. This is another, and I'm going to have four of them, and that's going to be the group, obviously. So alpha sub three of one maps to three, which means alpha sub three of two is going to map to six. And then alpha sub three of three is going to map to nine, but mod eight, that's one and so forth. And then I would continue that. So alpha sub five of one maps to five. Alpha sub five of two is going to map to 10, but 10 mod eight is two and so on and so forth. And then same thing with seven. So those are going to be my automorphisms. And I can see in the Cayley tables here that U of eight and the automorphism group of Z8, so not the automorphism, but each, there are four automorphisms, that's the automorphism group, that these two are isomorphic to one another. Coming up next, we have finished chapter six. We are moving on to chapter seven, dealing with cosets. So we're going to look at the definition and properties of a coset.